so many of us accept signs of aging as being normal. Things such as weight gain, fatigue, arthritis, belly fat, even chronic disease and changes in our skin. We oftentimes as women will just think, well, I'm just getting older. Well, today's guest is going to give us a different perspective on aging. Today I have with me Dr. Mani Kukresha, an integrative health expert and the founder of Live Age Well. She helps clients optimize gut health, immunity, and healthy aging. Dr. Mani is an MD, MPH, which is a Master of Public Health, and is certified in holistic nutrition. She is focused on integrative wellness, lifestyle medicine, biohacking, and she is an advocate for health and sustainable living, which I I love the idea of sustainable living because if we can't sustain things, there's an issue there. It has to be doable. Dr. Mani has published extensively on clinical health research. She is passionate about educating people on topics like anti-aging, skin health, and provides science-backed perspectives on the causes of aging and chronic disease risk factors, lifestyle measures to extend health span and lifespan. Her upcoming book is called Live More, Age Less. Dr. Mani, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for a beautiful introduction. I am I'm just delighted to be here. Well, I'm excited to dive into our conversation. When I was I was reading through some information on you, I saw that your your father had passed away from com- complications of diabetes and renal failure. My father also had renal failure, not diabetes, but um, cancer and renal failure. And so I know what it's like to go through that. How did that impact your um your life, how did that uh, change the trajectory of your life? Yeah, it was an agony and a struggle for him. You know, uh, he had suffered for uh, long-term diabetes and because of the complication of diabetes, he had to go through the, uh, you know, uh, the kidney transplant. And after that, you know, a time came when everything was just a hip, I mean, just too much chaos, you know, he couldn't control metabolically, all his systems were uh, on fire, <laughs> they were, um, they were just, you know, deteriorating day by day, and uh, he suffered from chronic renal failure, and then septicemia, and then succumbed to death, you know, and it was a pain for us, I mean, as a family to go through all this struggle, and at that time, I decided, and that I will take a path to do anything that I can in my career and in my future to help as many people as I can, you know, because sometimes it's, it's definitely lack of knowledge um, and awareness that, I mean, there are so many things that you can do in your normal day-to-day life to control. Uh, I know there's certain part, which is genetic, that you have genes, you know, but it's just 20%. But 80% is all your lifestyle maintain, you know. So there's a lot that you can do to maintain your lifestyle and do some daily activities and add some uh, medical and health-related supplements and certain stuff in your life that you can do a lot to correct those metabolic problems. And this, so that was, uh, you know, I did my MD at that time, but I wanted to really study the prevention of disease. And that's why I took a step and invested my time. Uh, and I did study MPH, that is Master's Public Health, and studied clinical research and epidemiology um, of all these diseases, you know, and learn how to prevent the disease, how the disease progress and how to prevent it. Rather than just, uh, you know, I could have taken a path to basically just do the conventional medicine, but that was not my thing because it was all about treating the symptoms with the help of bandage approach, you know, with the help of all those pharmaceuticals. But that was not my thing. I just wanted to really uh, invest my career in trying to know how to eradicate the root cause of disease. And that's why I wanted to study disease, progression, prevention, and how to control it. And that's what, uh, and you gave my introduction so well, you know, that's what I did. And uh, 10 years, I 
was involved in clinical research more than 12, uh, 10 years, actually, almost more than a decade, 12 to 14 years, I did clinical research uh, studying all these diseases. And at that time, I did publish many papers. And um, when I was good at that, then I thought, you know, okay, I need to study nutrition as well, because holistic uh, side of medicine is never being taught to us, you know, as a protocol in medi medical uh, education. Uh, we were never taught nutrition, you know, just maximum 10 to 15 minutes of a class, that's it. So I wanted to really study, you know, what are the different alternate and holistic ways to control your life styles, like, like food first approach is, I mean, you know, food is the first thing that you can take control and all by yourself in your own home, by your own education, by your own awareness and your own judgment, you know, what to eat, how to eat, when to eat, how much to eat and what kind of food to eat, you know, what is good for you, what's bad for you which a doctor will never take you in a clinic and will teach you. You know, it's never to be taught by anyone. You need to know all this by yourself. And um, that's why I wanted to study definitely nutrition and the holistic approach to the diseases. And I, I got certified in holistic nutrition from uh, IIN as well as Cornell University. And then I started to basically take my clients and I uh, launched my practice called Live Age Wealth, where I see my clients and we go client by client you know it's just listening to them what problem they have trying to connect so many dots you know because there are there are so many problems sometimes it's a hormonal issue sometimes it's a supplement it's like a micronutrient deficiency sometimes it's a gut problem your microbiomes are disturbed you know all those things are so interlinked to each other you cannot just come up with one diagnosis and say that okay this is you're suffering from leaky gut syndrome it's just not like that because if you have leaky gut syndrome there might be the root cause somewhere else maybe you have a um, autoimmune problem maybe you have food sensitivity or maybe because you're lacking in hormones like estrogen which again causes gut problems maybe uh, you, you 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 have some kind of chronic inflammation going on in your body which is causing leaky gut syndrome and because of leaky gut syndrome you're suffering from depression, ADHD, you know, brain fog and low cognition, you know, all those kind of troubles. So it's all basically the dots are everywhere. You need to connect them and then take multi-divisional approach to control that problem. So that's what I do with my uh, clients. So that's why I say, okay, this is just not only gut uh, gut issues. It's like, you know, I, I'll work with you on your immunity, on your food, on your sleep. So many factors that are involved, uh, so many foundations that are involved to basically optimize your cellular health. So yes. That's, that's what I do. Yes. Yeah. You know, I love that you hit on how everything is connected because that's really something I had to learn as a health coach, because, you know, we, we have that tendency to come in and we want to look for the one thing and wouldn't be, that would be so easy. That would make things very simple exactly. if it was one thing, but often there's this myriad of problems in gut health, like you had mentioned, hormonal health. I just recently had someone reach out to me and she said, well, I went through menopause and all of a sudden my body is on fire with inflammation. So I went down the rabbit hole to look at, okay, loss of estrogen and that connection to inflammation. And, and that's something I really wanted to touch on is the role of inflammation in aging. Can, can you speak into that a little bit and, and how, because I remember I had my nurse practitioner on and she said something that really struck me. She said, well, we, we all, when we die, we die of inflammation. And it really just hit me. I went, wow, you know, this, this is at the crux of it. Right. Very right. I mean, inflammation is the main driver of aging, right? So what is inflammation in medical sense? You know, inflammation, whenever there's a threat to our body, either from a virus or some injury, or we hit our foot on a nail, or there's a, uh, you know, we fall down and we have a wound or injury or some infection from some other pathogens from outside, and it tries to attack our body. Our body is very smart. Our body has an uh, inbuilt protective mechanism called immunity. You know, our immune response get into action and our white blood cells, they do produce inflammatory cytokines and all those inflammatory molecules, which act at that site 
to prevent that injury to flare up. It protect us from that injury that's happening from outside, from external source to our body. So what we see is, you know, we see a rush of fluid, we see warm and we see the redness. That means it's telling us that inflammation is going on around that area in our body. But that is just that is just acute inflammation, just inflammation, acute inflammation, because our body is being protected uh, by our uh, immunological responses and it is protecting us from external injuries or external pathogens. Acute inflammation, very good for us because that protects our body. But when that acute inflammation becomes chronic in nature, it goes on uh, in our body all the time, it becomes a problem for so many issues in our body, so many health-related problems in our body. It can cause it can cause myriad of problems, you know. I mean, if you see obesity, fat accumulation, if you see, uh, you know, eye damage, loss of hearing, muscle tissue loss, bone loss, frailty, uh, wrinkling of the skin, all these are nothing but just the chronic inflammation. And there is some cause somewhere, and we'll come to that, you know, with them, there are tons of causes. So that is what inflammation is. So inflammation is the main driver of aging. And why does inflammation happen? Now I'll tell you, I'll go a little bit more scientific physiology of that. You know, wh why is inflammation happening in our body and why does it increase with age? The reason for that is, you know, our cells are constantly functioning. We are sleeping, we are awake, we are thinking, we are doing the yard work, we are doing the kitchen work, we are uh, memorizing something, we are focusing on something, whatever function that we are doing, you know, our cells are constantly functioning. Uh, our, our body is constantly pumping oxygen and blood to every single part of our body. Our hormones are constantly functioning, our enzymes are constantly functioning. And because of all those critical functions that I mentioned, the basic is, you know, when you deep down to the foundation, our cells are actually functioning means they are uh, dividing. They are constantly dividing. We have uh, almost like 37 trillion cells in our body. Our body is a bunch of 37 trillions of cells and each cell has 20,000 genes, right? So our cells are constantly dividing. The genes are also basically dividing and modifying, you know, in order for that cell to be functioning op optimally. So when our cells are constantly working and dividing and then they are wearing and they are tearing off and then they become dead and then our body is clearing off those cells and then new cells are being formed. So all this process is highly metabolic, right? So they need a lot of energy during that time, they need a lot of an ATP. They use a lot of ATP energy production at that time. But as a result, a lot of toxic material, a toxic molecule, there's a lot of uh, burden of this toxic molecule that's produced around the tissue at that time. And that's called ROS, reactive oxygen species. And that reactive oxygen species causes oxidation around the tissue. And that oxidation basically uh, flares up the inflammation. So you see, inflammation is the inbuilt uh, process that will always goes on. That will always go on in the body, but our body has some protective mechanism, which is by default that clears up that inflammation, so that we all stay normal and healthy and optimal, right? But when your body loses that capacity loses that strength to fight with the inflammation. That is when we see the signs of aging. That is when we see the signs of age-related diseases. That is when we suffer from wrinkling of the skin. That is when our collagen gets, you know, inflamed. That is when our cells get glycated. And all this is causing, you know, tons and tons of age-related problems, right? Uh, and in the physical manifestation of that is we see that, okay, we are getting old. We have like gray hairs. We have wrinkled skin. We have obesity around our truncal uh, area, around our flanks, around our navel area. We are, our insulin sensitivity is not as great as it used to be. That means our metabolism is not as good as it used to be when I was a teenager or when you were a teenager. So we are suffering from every kind of uh, mechanism 
that's actually hurting us in on ourselves through inflammation. That's why inflammation is this term inflammaging is such a huge term uh, and this term is on fire because everybody's talking about it because inflammation is the main driver of aging and that's why it's together called as inflammaging and that's why we all are going through inflammaging that makes us uh, feel tired fatigue frail mm -hmm. you know that makes us feel that okay we are getting old so uh, and but, but there are so many things that you can do to fight that inflammation just like Carol, I, I love when you actually touched that, uh, you know, that lady who you who was your client and you were talking to, she is going through menopause and suddenly she is going through, you know, tons of issues, you know, bloating, headache and, uh, you know, gain, or gain uh, the weight gain around the central obesity, you know, that obesity, uh, central truncal area and the flanks area is all because your estrogen because when they go through the dip during the perimenopause and menopause time of your life the estrogen is highly anti-inflammatory but when you don't have estrogen you know your inflammation flares up right uh, by when you see i mean when we were born when we were just, we were born with almost one to two millions of uh, ovums or eggs right and we have tons of estrogen that keeps rising, rising, rising by the age of puberty. Um, but you know, this estrogen starts to decline after the age of 25 years, right? It starts to decline it, and it declines so steep that by the age we are 30 years of age, uh, we have only 10% of uh, eggs left. And by the age we are 40, we have only 3% of the eggs left. While you see, when we were born, we had like one to two million. So there's a sudden decline in the number of uh, eggs and ovums. Not only decline in the number, but also decline in their quality. So our uh, estrogen starts to decline steep after the age of 25 to 30. And we all suffer from, I mean, especially women, you know, when they reach the age of perimenopause, which is around 40. Uh, technically, we say 40 because average age of menopause is 50. So 10 years, give and take around that time, that means perimenopause starts from 40. You start to see the symptoms, you know. I mean, and it's bio-individuality. Some women suffer a lot. Some women just are more resilient and they can cope up with the symptoms, you know. So that's why you have bloating, uh, you know, excess weight, which is so resistant to the diet and exercise, you know, it, whatever you do, it just doesn't go. It's just a resistant accumulation of fat, obesity. And, and again, you know, whenever the fat cells are also highly inflammatory, when you have fat cells accumulation, especially around your viscera, the visceral fat increases because of low estrogen, right? And when you have this accumulation of visceral fat, that means the fat that is accumulated around the viscera or the organ, it's it's highly inflammatory. It, it, it actually releases the molecule called cytokines. And that is what is, again, causing inflammation. So you see, I mean, there are a number of dots we are connecting that is it metabolic because of sugar and insulin metabolism, or is it because of hormones? It's because of what? But all those factors together, they, they just drive inflammation. And inflammation yes. causes all these uh, symptoms. Yes. And I, I think we're back to that, that holistic approach where there's so many things that are happening. I've even heard with uh, autoimmune disease that you might have a physical trigger, you might have some uh, genetic factor in there, and then even past trauma that's unresolved and these things colliding I remember my nurse practitioner first telling me, because I, I was diagnosed with RA uh, at the age of 54, but I think it was slowly progressing long before then. And I said, what caused it? And, and that's what she said. She said, in my experience, there's stressors. So there's the environmental stressors, and then maybe you've got some kind of past unresolved trauma, and it, it's like such a trigger. Have you seen the same thing? Hundred percent, absolutely, very well said, Carol. Uh, autoimmune is such a complex uh, problem. I mean, I myself suffer from Hashimoto's autoimmune thyroiditis, 
and because of which I have hypothyroidism. I can deal with my hypothyroidism because I know what to do. But then autoimmune is very complex because um, it's, it's a disease, but at the same time, it's the trigger can be so many. The trigger can be your mental stress. The trigger can be your lack of sleep. The trigger can be your lack of exercise. Trigger can be your obesity. Uh, the trigger can be, you know, all those toxins all around you, environmental toxins, like the water that you drink. Maybe it has um, all that heavy metals in it, the fluorides in toothpaste, you know, phthalates and parabens present in makeup and skincare. Um, all these toxins all around us, even otherwise, you know, even the UV radiations that are emitted through the light bulbs or EMF through your cell phones and all those technological uh, things, you know, so all those together, they, they are all called environmental toxins. And they are also the trigger factors for autoimmune problems. Definitely 20% may be autoimmune. I mean, or the reason may be genetic, but 80% is all through the lifestyle and environmental toxins. I kind of just uh, I kind of just keep it like under the broad umbrella like this: 20% genetic, 80% is environmental lifestyle. Then I divide the environmental and lifestyle as half and half, you know. Um, and uh, and that's why I say, okay, uh, thank God that it is only 20% genetic, which is not in our control. Mm -hmm. But 80% you have, you can do a lot to basically correct and optimize your health by taking control in that 80% uh, wide umbrella, you know? So, I mean, I that's what I did. I mean, for me, I mean, I'm a, I am trained conventional medicine doctor. I did go to my endocrino uh, endocrinologist. I went to the PCP and no one, I mean, not even to one. I went to almost five, six. And, you know, everywhere, I mean, they could not figure out. They had not figured out even after five years of me having all these problems, what's going on, because I suffered. I had a lot of gut issues. I had eczema, I mean, not too much, but when it flared up, you know, in my fingers and places where it does, uh, I knew that. It's, it's a flare-up of my autoimmune problem. And um, uh, then I, st I studied and studied and did a lot of research. At the time came that I was pretty well-versed and well-educated, and I knew what I, I mean, I, saw, I do have gluten. I mean, I, I knew that there is definitely some kind of food that is a trigger for my autoimmune to flare up. And whenever my autoimmune flared up, I have digestive issues, you know. I, I have... B12 deficiency because my nutrients could not be absorbed efficiently through my gut, you know, and then I suffered from nutritional deficiency, especially B12 and iron, which is very common. I mean, very commonly people are deficient in that, but I knew what's going on inside my body and body is so smart. It tells you immediately, you know, I, and it's, and that's why I tell my clients that it's just not that I'm going to treat you and tell you, do this, do this. I basically sit with them, explain them because I think education and awareness uh, plays a huge role, um, you know, for you to know what you got to do. And when I figured out that it's the sugar, it's the sweet food, and it's the gluten that messes me up like crazy. Mm -hmm. And when I did control those two things, uh, my autoimmune go into remission for many years. And I know when I again go into that bad behavior, <laughs> bad eating, <laughs> uh, it, it, it flares up. I mean, we are human, you know, it's not that I will never consume wine or I'll never consume a, a dessert. Up. I mean, it happens. But if I go out of my control and do that, um, I do suffer from the rashes and I, I, my, I do suffer from swelling under my eyes, you know, a little bit bloating. I know that something is wrong. So I've been able to basically bring the autoimmune into remission for seven years. And when I knew that this is happening, I just stopped going to the conventional endocrinologist because I knew what to do. I didn't even have to take a medication. I didn't have to take an immunomodulator to control my autoimmunity, but I just do it through exercise and food and sleep, definitely through mental stress. When I am going through the stress, I know it again is a problem. When you sleep well, I'm very well optimized, you know. So mm. that's what happens. And, and it's not only for autoimmunity, it's, I think, for many other factors as well, you know. Sleep. You hit on sleep. Mm -hmm. And that's been coming up in my in my community and with my clients over and over again, because we hit that perimenopausal 
window through the 40s and that's when you really notice that disruption when progesterone kind of makes that exit and then some some months there's ovulation some months there's no ovulation so it's this back and forth uh, cortisol can become an issue i remember in my 40s all of a sudden i wasn't handling stress very well uh, my body just couldn't uh, couldn't deal with it and of course the 40s can be a stressful time you're caring often for aging parents you know sick parents which was my case plus i had small children and a job and trying to balance all of these things sleep went by the wayside so let, let's talk a little bit about sleep. What, it, what is ha happening when we're sleeping uh, that is so important, so critical for, let's say, bringing down inflammation? Yeah, you said so well about the sleep. You know, when you are young teen, you do sleep well and you can mm -hmm. even get away with six to seven hours, you know, six hours is also okay. But as you get older, it's just, you know, you especially for women, because they go through that uh, steep decline in progesterone, which really disturbs your sleep, not only disturbs your sleep, but it whatever, even if you're sleeping for seven to eight hours, but your quality of sleep is disturbed because of lack of progesterone. And I, I knew about it all the time scientifically, but I have been myself because I just started my hormone uh, HRT, my bioidentical HRT, hormone replacement therapy for last six months. And I cannot tell you, Carol, the improvement. I know I've gotten improvement in many, like, okay, bloating is not an issue. My skin is getting clearer. Uh, my skin has been always good, but, you know, I just think that that estrogen is, I feel that, you know, my collagen and elastin, uh, you know, on my skin is just getting improved with the help of estrogen. But my sleep is like, I sleep like a baby. I sleep so well that I am not only taking progesterone from 14 to 28 days of the cycle, which how the progesterone is designed to be consumed. I've been, uh, now I just take it every single day. I don't care if my cycle is getting anovulatory because I'm 51 year old. I don't really care if it is getting anovulatory because I'm taking progesterone, but I don't want to go through that cyclical you know, lack of sleep for 15 days and then getting improved sleep next 15 days. I just take micronized oral progesterone and that's, uh, that's, that just is like a game changer for the improvement in my sleep. I feel like I am like a new person. Next day I wake up with so much energy and I have so much uh, strength all day to be doing all that I do, you know, that because sleep is paramount. I mean, it's, it's non-negotiable. Sleep is one of the very critical foundation of aging and age-related disease, the prevention of that. Because when you sleep, you know, we have, <clears throat> and first I'll talk about what is the right amount of sleep. Sleeping for eight to nine to 10, eight to nine hours is critical. If you are sleeping less than eight hours, somewhere around four to five hours, your chances of having Alzheimer's and dementia increases by two times more than your control wow. group. So it's a huge number. I mean, there's a, there's a study done on 24,000 subjects uh, from National Health uh, Foundation of a is Sleeping. And it, it, they found out that, you know, they had the cases, cases versus control among all those 24,000 subjects. People who slept for four to five hours their chances of having dementia was two times more than the control group who slept for eight hours. So it's a huge number. And at the same time, another study was done that if you are sleeping for just four to five hours in a day, in a night, versus the control group who slept for night sleep, seven to eight to nine hours, your stem cell uh, production, as well as your stem cell activity, gets to 50% less than, again, your control group, you know, the comparison group. So, and you know, and all of us know that we all need stem cells. I mean, stem cells are our protectors in a way that whichever part of our body suffer from aging or decline in functioning or uh, disease, stem cells goes into that area of our body 
and then they produce new cells to basically recover that particular organ or that particular tissue. So stem cells are critical for our body. And you know, with age, our stem cells are anyway declining in number and quality. So we don't want to do it more by not sleeping well. So sleep is a huge factor when you when your body actually recovers all the day your cells are going through you know functioning you're constantly your cells are functioning your neurons are functioning you know but when you sleep that's the stage of recovery that's a stage of uh, you know uh, recovery and rest that is when your neurons your brain cells they wire and fire with each other during the time of sleep. The whole day you are thinking, critically thinking, focusing, memorizing, taking decisions, you know, all the critical thinking. But in the night, when you sleep, your neurons, they wire fire with each other. When these neurons wire and fire with each other constantly, uh, there is reduced risk of neuroplasticity. That means your brain do not become rigid. Your brain is quite flexible. And uh, and when you don't have neuroplasticity, that means you increases your cognition powers, you increases your ability to adapt to new learnings. You see, like you must have heard that, you know, when people become old, they become senile. We say, okay, he's old and senile, you know, and he is just not learning new things and he refuses to learn new things. And that is he's resilient to learn new things is because of the neuroplasticity. So in order to reduce that risk of neuroplasticity, you need to be sleeping well because you need your neurons to be constantly wiring and firing with each other. Not only that, other very important thing that goes on during the phase of deep sleep, like, you know, our sleep has different phases, right? Deep sleep, REM, non-REM, and all that. So beta waves are when we are thinking constantly, you know, when we are taking decision, critical thinking, that is beta waves and when in the deep sleep we have delta waves that are active so during deep sleep all the toxins that you have produced in your cerebrospinal fluid around your neurons they get cleared off uh, there's a toxin called beta amyloid when there's excessive accumulation of beta amyloid that causes alzheimer's that causes forgetfulness that causes dementia in the old age but you, if you're able to basically clear off that beta amyloid out of your CSF or cerebrospinal fluid and you don't have those bad toxins, uh, you don't suffer from Alzheimer's. So that's a, that's a very critical functioning going on during the time of sleep, you know. And plus also, I mean, some people say, okay, my I saw my score, my I slept for eight hours, my deep sleep was pretty good enough, but... You have to have a balanced REM sleep as well because REM sleep is also mm -hmm. not to be ignored. Uh, you cannot just have a nice deep sleep and few minutes of REM because REM sleep is when you basically convert your short-term memories to long-term memories. So for your memory functioning, you need to have a pretty optimized REM sleep. So mm -hmm. both deep sleep, REM sleep, both of them are very, very important. Uh, when we th when we see our score in the morning, you know, uh, through Aura Ring or whatever gadgets you wear. I wear an Aura Ring and I would you agree do. with yeah. you. If one of those is off, I notice certain things. It's kind of an eye opener. You do need that, that balance of that deep sleep with a rim because sometimes I'll have, I don't know, two hours of deep sleep and just a few minutes of rim and I'll find my cognition to be somewhat off on that day. And then if yeah. my deep sleep isn't there, I feel a deep sense of fatigue or I just don't, I don't have the resilience that I would normally have because that repair didn't take place. And I, I'm in the gym, I'm lifting weights, I'm active, doing a lot of things. We need that balance of recovery. Yeah. And it's, it's just so important uh, for everything, for weight maintenance, for cognition, for cellular repair. The list just goes on and on, just the this one thing. On sleep. But I remember how I, I watched my parents with sleep and then I watched my in-laws with sleep. And you could see they got older and older and pretty soon they were like sleeping two, three hours a night. And they would try telling me, oh, this is just what happens when you get old. 
why is that happening where we know the sleep declines in perimenopause, menopause, but when you get into those elderly years, say your, your 80s, for instance, uh, why does it go down to just virtually nothing? I think there is no solid reason for that, but it's just aging. But I really think it might have to do with hormones. Uh, hormones play a critical role in regulation of your sleep. Uh, and uh, if your hormones are regulated, and that's why, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I mean, my parents never, they were never told about hormones or hormone regulation or to be taking any kind of supplements or hormones if they are deficient. You know, they had no clue of that. But I do see that they suffer. My mom has weak bones. You know, we're always protective of, I mean, like, you know, be careful, just walk slow. And, you know, we know that she has very weak bones. Plus sarcopenia, they don't have too much muscle because everything just declines. But I think uh, it got to do a lot with hormones. Hormones play a major role in sleep regulation. And that's why I always, when I get my clients, okay, when I'm doing their uh, biomarker testing, if male, you just check their testosterone free and bound, DHEA, and also check for their cortisol level. You know, and again, another another um, factor is also cortisol. Our cortisol level increases with aging. And this, uh, this really, again, messes up your sleep because it's highly inflammatory. It causes inflammation uh, around the brain and the brain cells. And that's the cause for lack of sleep. Uh, cortisol and hormones and that's why for female you got to be checking for their um, estrogen progesterone and testosterone also check for their fsh check for their L uh, lh luteinizing hormone and also definitely cortisol so cortisol definitely needs to be even if i you tell me okay i'm not going through any mental stress but we are all human we will 100 percent have cortisol increase and dip so if you check the cyclical, uh, you know, throughout the day, your cortisol will be up and down, up and down, up and down, you know, irrespective of you telling me that are you going through any mental stress or any mental trauma or not, irrespective of that. It's human nature. Cortisol will be up and down. And that cortisol is also one of the reasons for sleep dysregulation. That is why it is very important to be checking these lab biomarkers uh, very extensive, just not something what your PCP does, you know, what he will, he or she, you know, I mean, they don't have time. They just get 10 to 11 minutes to be seeing each patient. And that's not enough to be elaborately knowing about a patient, you know, uh, just knowing your CBC, your hemoglobin, HbA1c, it's just, you know, and uh, iron and all those kind of, you need to be definitely knowing what how much is uh, is there any source of inflammation by checking hscrp it's a great biomarker if your hscrp is more than 0 0.5 that's indicative of some kind of chronic inflammation going on in your body so it's very important to check for your hscrp it is very critical to check for your fasting insulin for me i mean even if i don't get the levels of don't get to see the levels of fasting blood sugar more important to me if I can see fasting insulin, because by looking at insulin, I can actually detect the problem much before then disease happening. I can look for pre-diabetic patients than actually patients who have already suffered from it, you know, who have already declared as diabetes. I like to I like to control the disease when these patients are or these clients are pre-diabetic, you know, and that is what you get to do. Uh, that is uh, that is what you detect by seeing the fasting insulin rather than seeing the fasting glucose. Fasting glucose is nothing. I mean, fasting glucose is going to change. I mean, every day is going to be different. Mm -hmm. That's not indicative of anything, you know. Uh, scientifically, it doesn't make sense. So, yeah, definitely, I mean, uh, to come back to your uh, question of sleep disturbances as you age is because of definitely cortisol, because of inflammation, because of hormonal imbalances, and because of also definitely, I know old people wake up many times in the night, you know, for going to the bathroom because your bladder is not, uh, bladder is overreactive. It's not as strong as it used to be when you were a young adult, you know, so. Yeah, so very true. I, I really like that you hit on the fasting insulin because I've been encouraging all my clients, particularly if they are experiencing certain physical symptoms, 
I said, get that fasting insulin because it tells you so much and you want to be able to catch these things early so you can turn things around because it, it can take a while if, if somebody has a high fasting insulin, it can take a while to turn that around. So true. I think sugar and knowing about the insulin is the prime first detection I would like to, you know, when I just have a client or even for myself. I mean, that's the very first detection point that I would love to know because that will help me to navigate so many other dots that I connect. I can connect and I can t take control because sugar is such a, I mean, it's the culprit uh, starting from inflammation, immunity, cancer, obesity, cardiovascular disease, brain strokes, uh, or whatever problems you can think of, you know, uh, sugar is the biggest driver. I mean, mainly 95% of the time, it is, it is the number one driver of those problems, you know, or at least the initial initiation factor for those problems. Because <clears throat> blood sugar metabolism, you know, you think about cancer. I mean, I, okay, let's talk about, let's start like this. You know, if you have high blood sugar in your blood all the time, in the normal person who is 25 to 30 to 35 year old uh, adult, you know, and is exercising heavily and is like, you know, not sedentary all the time, very metabolically optimized uh, blood sugar is maintained in that person if he doesn't have any other disease, extra you know, problems. But as you get old, you are sedentary, you're not exercising, you know, you don't have that much muscle. And that's why it's like, okay, always exercise and build muscle. Because muscle is the organ that is that acts like a incinerator or sink for the glucose disposal. But you and the primary aim should be you don't want to have glucose flow, floating around in the blood all the time. Definitely, this is your primary goal, and that is why our body is naturally built in the way that you know the moment we have the surge of sugar in the blood, our pancreas produces insulin to go and neutralize and take that sugar out of the blood and put it in the right places to put it in either muscle liver, you know, wherever they need to be stored and uh, use some of the sugar for ATP or energy production as a fuel to be doing the cellular functioning. So they, they pick the sugar, give it to the cells when it is then and where it is needed. Extra sugar is taken and thrown into the muscles and liver. But if we don't have enough muscle, uh, so see, muscle gives us extra currency for that metabolic functioning you know it gives us that extra currency to hold that extra sugar that's why i will say no muscle you have on your body you are more metabolically flexible this is a sentence we always use but what is the meaning of this that means that more muscles we have we can actually store more sugar into the muscle so that we keep the we keep the blood free of sugar we keep the blood clean because if there is always sugar and a glucose molecule in the blood it causes glycation of the cell because blood keeps flowing everywhere into the cells, tissues, organs, everywhere blood flows, right? So finally, blood is going to those end places where it needs to be, but it's carrying all the sugar there. So all the, all the organs are basically getting the glycated blood, right? So because of that glycation, it goes and causes the glycation of the cells of those organs and tissues also. And then that you know that AGE, the advanced glycation end products, you know, that is number one cause of inflammation. That glycation causes inflammation. When it goes to the skin, it causes the glycation of co collagen. And that is how our collagen depletes, right? Uh, and we see the wrinkles. When it goes to, uh, you know, uh, heart, it's bad. It, it It is bad for your, I mean, it's it's just bad for, every single organ, every single cells and tissues of your body. So that is why it's, it's very, um, it's like the whole myriad of the problems, you know, uh, you need to have a healthy uh, insulin in order to manage that blood sugar. You need to avoid having those steep rise in the blood sugar. 
your blood sugar level should be i know sugar will always stay there but it needs to be pretty well and leveled and maintained rather than having the rise and then steep decline and that is that is what you call being metabolically flexible you know and how you do it by having to have good amount of good, the good kind of food you know because food first approach by adding some good fiber because fiber helps you know to neutralize all that um, it will it, it helps to avoid those kind of sugar rise and decline and then by going to exercise all the times because you build muscle so that you can store up all that extra sugar in there uh, yeah and, and then nice sleep or recovery Yes, you just hit on the lifestyle habits that I that I have in yeah. my in my program where, you know, we're looking at not just one thing, we're looking at the sleep, we're looking at the hydration, the strength training, the daily movement that's not formal exercise, neat. But but really, if I feel like if many women would just do the one thing, the strength training, now of course there's not one thing, but what a great place to start. Because often what I see is it, it leads to better habits, especially if they realize, okay, I need more protein to sustain this muscle, to sustain myself in the gym, more uh, quality muscle, skeletal muscle means less body fat. So, you know, from that perspective, and then like you mentioned, being a sink for glucose, being a disposal for glucose. I mean, really, if we started at one spot. So when you're starting with a client, uh, this is a really good question that I want to touch on. Where are you starting? Are, are you telling them to do this first and this second or all of the things or let's get muscle on your body? What is the starting point that people should focus on to make change? I, I think all goes together hand in hand, right? But like, and the it doesn't cost you, right? I mean, if you are telling your client to go with improved diet, exercise, and sleep, it's cheap. It's not costing. Uh, plus also, uh, at the same time, when the client is going through those three lifestyle habits, you know, correction and improvement of those lifestyle habits, you check on your end, scientifically, all the blood biomarkers that I, we just talked about, you know, okay, lipid panel, uh, where you are actually looking for cholesterols, LDL, HDLs, triglyceride, LP, little a, ApoB protein. You are checking for kidney function test, liver function test. You are checking for HbA1c, fasting insulin. You are also checking for hormones, cortisols, and uh, female and male hormones. So when you have the overall picture of the medical and scientific side on one end, on your end, and at the same time, basically, you are teaching your client to basically uh, the diet and sleep and exercise, out of which diet and exercise is what you really got to be teaching in a pretty ex uh, extensive manner because the very first thing first is food first approach. So uh, you, you are, if your client is eating, if a person is eating organic food, clean food, you know, food which is uh, rich in polyunsaturated fatty acids, low processed, I mean, unprocessed food and um, food which is full of fiber and polyphenols. That itself will correct almost 50% of the problems, you know. Plus at the same time, if he or she is hitting the gym at least three times in the day to begin with or two times in the day to begin with, it's perfect. And then, you know, when they get into that motion, when they get motivated to do that and they like it, they can do more, you know. Um, then it depends that what kind benefits them, you know, uh, is high density interval training or aerobic exercise is good for them or they like it or what they are looking for the benefits for muscles, mass and muscle strength. If they're looking for muscle mass and muscle strength, definitely do resistance training, do free weights and weighted machines. But if the goal of that person is to basically lose weight, and he, she or he wants to improve the endurance, then she and he can go for the, the high intensity or aerobic exercise. So depending on the goal of the patient, uh, the client. So food, exercise, and definitely sleep. So this is something that's in their hand. They will do it. And then at the same time, you have checked their pictures of blood biomarker, what is wrong. And then you start to basically 
you know, take next steps to correct, adding some supplements, uh, you know, if, and if that adding some supplements or adding hormones or omega-3 fatty acid, or that person is deficient in uh, magnesium, and that person is deficient in vitamin D, which are very, very common micronutrient deficiencies, you know, so you add those things. And then three months from then, you because our body is designed in a way that you got to give body with all those changes at least three months then you got then you get to see the improvement uh, patients or the client will start to see the improvement in three to four weeks but in order to be visibly or noticeably seeing the improvement uh, you got to give body three months and then to again meet with your client three months later and definitely i am i mean there is not even a single person who meets with me after three months and like, okay, no, it did not because these are the most common things that you can correct, you know, and these are the most common reason that are deficient in some or the other way that can optimize your health overall. So this is how I start. And definitely, I think the most important thing is to listen to the patient and listen to the client is so important. That's the first thing that I have learned uh, when I changed my career from conventional to uh, more functional side of the medicine or functional approach of the functional and integrative approach, listen, because when a client is telling you something, it, he or she can listen to her body. And that's why she or he is coming up with that symptom or complaint, you know. So you got to listen to the client and, uh, you know, and believe in that patient or client and then start to take your approaches for correction of those correction and optimization of those factors. The integrative approach is so important. And I feel like practitioners like you, that you, you have the traditional medical training, Western medicine background, but then you, you also have more of the functional approach and then combining those two, I feel is, is beneficial because there are times where, yeah, we need, we need Western medicine. And there are times where, no, that's not enough. That's a band-aid. We need to get to the root cause and what's actually causing these symptoms or disease and what can we do about it. Now, now with people who, and this has been on my mind a lot, it was on my mind as you were speaking, I, I can afford to go and pay, I go to a nurse practitioner that doesn't take my health insurance. So I pay out of pocket, which is absolutely fine. I have the resources to do that. I pay for additional testing. So I run through my insurance what I can and the rest I'll get say labs from Boston Heart and, and different different places. And I'm, I'm right on it, but some people don't have those resources and it pains me or they don't have the maybe the resources for the gym membership or some of these different things or supplements what can they do? What are just some simple things that they can do if people just, just don't have those resources? These supplements are all very low hanging fruits, uh, which are present all around us. And I think doing great research, reading about that supplement and reading the label, uh, what ingredients does it contain is very important. At most sometimes, even if I buy a $99 supplement, but there would be something which would be a red flag to me that, okay, I am not really getting this supplement. I mean, I don't have any problem spending the money. I mean, I'm thankfully, luckily, but I know just like you mentioned many people, but you can definitely by doing the extensive research, you can definitely find supplements in the market. There are a number of supplements nowadays in the market. Uh, you can easily find these supplements for even $20, $15, but they are nice and clean and good brands, you know. I mean, they'll give you exactly what you need rather than going, uh, if I'm telling you to buy something for $99 or $100, don't do that. Do your own research. I think it is very, very important. Uh, being educated and being aware what to do, what to purchase, how to read the label is very, very important. If you're buying some food from Whole Foods or from Publix or wherever, you know, from Sprouts. Just look at the back. Always turn the product and read the label. That's the utmost important thing. That's what I teach my clients, you know. I mean, there are some things that you can even get away by eating things which are not organic because they'll be still clean. But there are certain foods, you know, 
uh, you definitely need to spend your money <laughs> buying from uh, Whole Food or be, because that definitely needs to be organic, you know, because they are, if they are, if you are eating those fruits uh, in non-organic way, they are heavily infested with pesticides, you know, really bad stuff for your hormones, causes a lot of hormone distru- disruption. So, yeah, I think it is your judgment, I think, which is very important. And for that, I think education, I mean, yourself being educated, what to do, which food to eat, how to read the label, and to see what ingredients it contain is very important. Plus, sleep doesn't cost you anything. I mean, if you are correcting your sleep, you're anyway taking care of 40% of the problems. Going to the gym, I know sometimes it costs most of the time it costs membership, but you can definitely find some gym memberships which are a little cheaper. Don't go to very high-end gym. Plus, uh, there are a few patients or, or clients of mine, it's not that money is a trouble for them, but they are very busy. They are like executive levels. You know, They don't have time to go to the gym membership. So there are some exercises that you do at home. And I'll tell you, I mean, these are called Vilpa, V-I-L-P-A. Uh, the full form is vigorous intensity uh, lifestyle physical activity so vilpa vigorous intensity lifestyle physical activity which you can just do at home because like for example if you're busy all day seeing your clients doing your life you know taking care of your parents and taking care of your kids you know you don't have time to go to the gym membership for you it's not that the gym membership is a problem i know there are some socioeconomic group membership is a problem for you, time is a problem. For me, again, time and lifestyle, you know, it doesn't let me go to the gym as much as I want to, whatever the reason can be. So you can do those exercises at home. And this is, uh, these are the exercises that you do from one to three minutes, one to three minutes, three times in a day. And you do so aggressively that, you know, you bring your max HR, maximum heart rate, to 80% uh, level. And what is max HR? So just for the people who do not know, maximum heart rate is your age minus 220. So for example, if I am 50, 50 minus 220 is 170. So my maximum heart rate, as far as that it can go in a healthy way, should be 170. It should not go beyond 170. If I'm going beyond 170 heart rate, that means I'm causing more harm to me and uh, I'm initiating some factors in my heart and blood that can be harmful to me. So I have to be staying below 170 as per my age. So 80% of that 170 means somewhere around 150. So that's the max, uh, 80% of max HR for me, my, life, my, my status. So I need to be working out one to three minutes, three times in a day to bring my max HR to 80% level. That is what you call Vilpa. And, you know, and then they did start, it, it was so effective, this particular style of exercise and the trend of a whole thing, Vilpa, was so helpful and beneficial that when they did the study on certain number of subjects, uh, they found out that it reduces your all cause mortality to 30 to 40 percent. So you see, I mean, wow. the clinical research indicated 30 to 40 percent reduction in all cause mortality, which is a huge number just by doing those exercises at home itself, you know. And then people ask me, OK, what kind of exercises? Anything which involves a contraction of the muscle. What, what is exercise or what is a workout? In general terms, it is called contraction of your muscle. Anything that involves a contraction of the muscle in a way that you're doing some pushing some pulling, some kind of leg work, and some kind of aerobics. These four things you have to, uh, uh, you know, keep in mind that, you know, pushing, pulling, leg exercise, and aerobic. If you're involving those four kind of uh, physical activities that you are basically initiating your muscles to be going into contraction mode, that, that will form your whole regime. And simple thing is pushing, pulling, you can do both of those actions through bench press which you can do at home. Leg exercise, you can do squats. And aerobics, you can do jumping jacks. So if you do those three things at home, you literally form the whole protocol. You know, I mean, you you are doing what needs to be done at the basic level. 
because the concept is that when you are contracting your muscles or when you're doing your workout or exercise, you cause the muscle fiber injury, right? And when there's a muscle fiber injury, it's called hormesis, the, in the intentional stress to the muscle fiber. And when you cause the injury to the muscle fiber, which is good because it's a low level of acute inflammation to the muscle fiber. But when that happens, your body sends those healing molecules, uh, the growth hormones, and all those kind of good product molecules, you know, at that place, in this case, it's muscle, to initiate the repair of those muscles. And when those muscles are repaired, you, you get more new muscles, which are much stronger, more resilient, and more youthful. So that's what you want. And that, in turn, increases the muscle mass as well as muscle strength. And that's what your goal is. Because what, why, why do you go do exercise? Because your goal is to basically increase your muscle mass and muscle strength. And you are basically, um, you're able to accomplish that by causing the acute inflammation in the muscle fiber by doing the exercise. And these are the three basic, basic actions of any workout that I just mentioned. It's a simple thing people can even do at home without buying the gym membership. But yes, if you are phonetic, if you are really exercise freak and you think that you get more uh, motivated by going to the gym, I, I mean, I get more motivated by going to the gym. Yes, I like to do when I'm working out with other people working out there as well. You know, it's like a community, right? With like-minded people, mm -hmm. right? I get more rush of those uh, feel-good hormones and motivation hormones, you know, I, then I work out even better. But somehow, if your socioeconomic status is not allowing you to do that, or maybe not only socioeconomic status, if your time and lifestyle doesn't allow you, you can do a lot at home. There cannot be no excuse. There cannot be any excuse to be not doing the exercise because exercise and working out is paramount. It's just most critical thing. You got. I mean, it, it, there's no other medicine or supplement in anti-aging world that can be as good as exercise. It's a youth elixir. That was beautifully said, Dr. Mani. I mean, really, I, I couldn't agree more. And you're right about the simplicity. I have a lot of clients and it's not because of money, it's more because of time that they work out, they have a set of maybe three of the longer bands with the, the handles. And then they've got the shorter like glute loops for the legs. And maybe there's some uh, body weight exercises in there. And then they've got a couple of sets of dumbbells or maybe three sets of dumbbells, light, medium, heavy. And that's their home gym. And that's not that expensive. I mean, a lot of it you can get on Amazon, have it delivered to your house. And I, I have quite a few that they're busy women. Like you said, they're executives and they, they just do their workouts from homes. So that was really beautifully beautifully put. Now, I, I want to be respectful of your time, Dr. Mani. And as we start to wrap up, uh, was there anything I didn't ask you or anything we didn't discuss that you'd like the listener to know? And then how can people get a hold of you and work with you? Sure. Uh, I think we did touch a lot of topic on the surface level. I mean, we, we can go on and on quite deeper into this, you know, but that's maybe not the time. I, I mean, on the surface level, we did touch everything, but I like to say a few sentences about supplements, you know, especially micronutrients. Like in our day-to-day -day life, we are always, okay, we are going to be eating this much fat, 30% fat, 30% carbohydrates, and 40% protein. We need to be aware of our protein content, definitely. You know, we'll, just like I said, okay, food first, but definitely make sure that you have enough protein, you know. And by now, through internet and Google search, everybody knows how much protein to take, you know, around 1.2 per kg for sedentary people, for people who are working out 1.6 and people who are extensively working out or who are uh, professional athletes, they should be taking around 2.2 grams per kg of their body weight. So that's all done and simple and make sure that you, you always consume some um, high quality protein, which contains BCAA branch chain amino acid and that is leucine, isoleucine, valine, but 100% make sure that you are consuming leucine, definitely, because that's the most important amino acids that's needed for 
muscle protein synthesis, especially when you're working out for recovery, you need something to be put into your body. And that is leucine around five grams per day is needed period. That is what you need for muscle protein synthesis. So we know about all these macronutrients, but definitely I'll, I'll like to say a few sentences about micronutrients because that's something which is overlooked most of the time overstudied, understated, uh, but that's why I definitely want to mention about micronutrients, that micronutrients are, are, are also very, very important because for all the cellular functioning, for hormones, for enzymes, all these micronutrients are important. And what are micronutrients? Micronutrients are vitamins, minerals, fatty acids, and amino acids. And out of all, and we, our body has like, we have around 20 to 30 essential micronutrients, but out of which I think the most essential, which you got to be really careful and make sure that you're consuming those in form of either pills, supplements, and also through your diet, which are number one, vitamin D, and then magnesium, and then omega-3 fatty acids. Vitamin D, why I say, and just persist that, you know, vitamin D is utmost important because 70% irrespective of whatever our diet, 70% of us in US population are basically deficient in vitamin D. So it is very important and critical to be consuming vitamin D through supplement form. And uh, when I say deficient, that means we have insufficiency of vitamin D. That means our levels are th less than 30%, less than 30. If we check our levels are less than 30, most of the time, you know. So we need to take vitamin D every single day, 4,000 IU international unit is the upper safe limit. Don't take more than that because then it can cause toxicity. Uh, but always check your levels before starting any supplements and six months after taking it. Very, very important because you don't want to be overly doing it in order to cause toxicity, right? So vitamin D is very important. Then magnesium is very important. 400 milligrams of magnesium per day is the adult dose, you know, because magnesium is utmost critical for enzymatic actions and we have like around 300 enzymatic activities going on in the body it's like dna synthesis dna repair genetic material repair because if we don't do it and all the broken down dna is basically you know lying up there around the tissue uh, that causes oncogenic activity around the tissue and that increases your chances of having increased risk of cancer so it's very important to basically maintain your enzymes through taking magnesium. Magnesium is important for all the enzymatic actions or enzymatic activities. So take your magnesium, you know, through again, tablet forms, because 50% of US population and developed countries, they are deficient in magnesium. And the last one, which is very important, which is very important for our brain function, for our heart function, for our skin, and for our hormones is omega-3 fatty acids. They are number one, um, uh, molecules that reduces inflammation and you know we know we all know by now that you know inflammation is number one cause or driver for aging so omega-3 fatty acid consume around 1.5 to 2 grams per day and even besides consuming through supplement try to consume it through you know fish the marine sources uh, like uh, sardine, uh, sardines and salmon and all those marine sources of uh, uh, because because when you consume omega-3 fatty acid through your marine sources, they there are two essential fatty acids called EPA and DHA, which are very important for heart and brain. You know, you get the enough supply of them, and that's critical for some, uh, lowering down inflammation. I have seen many clients, they not only lower down the inflammation by adding this omega-3 fatty acid, their cholesterol levels were much more improved. Their triglyceride levels were much down, it hunkers down your triglyceride levels. So it's important. So just, and and do your testing. That's all I wanted to say about those three supplements because if I had not mentioned about it, my our talk would have been incomplete. So very important. And your next question was? Uh, oh, how can, can, yeah, how they can reach you. Okay. So they can reach me by emailing me. My website is liveagewell.net, L-I-V a-g-e-w-e-l-l dot net. That's my website. And they can, I'm very active on my Instagram. Uh, they can find me on my Instagram and the handle is dr underscore m-a-n-i money dot 
Kukreja, K-U-K-R-E-J-A. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Mani. And I really appreciate that you hit on the micronutrients because that's something I've I've really been on a mission with. I did bodybuilding for many years and shows. And of course we were so focused on macronutrients. I didn't realize at the time that I was deficient in many micronutrients because my focus was just, and it, you know, it should be on the protein, but I was for, forgetting about those important micronutrients. I love that you, that you hit on that. And I so much appreciate you taking time. This has been extremely valuable for, for me and for the listeners. So thank you so much, Dr. Mani. Thank you for having me on your show. Absolutely. And to our listeners, wherever you are in the world, we wish you every blessing. Bye for now.